Open your Bibles once again to the book of Genesis 35. We're going to begin reading in verse 27. We're going to read to the end of the chapter where God's holy word says this, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years, then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, teach us your word. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us that we might understand, that we might proclaim, that we might honor and glorify Jesus with our attention, our intentions to be what you have called us to be, and are receiving your grace and putting into practice what you teach us this morning. Oh, Father, give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I looked last night at the author of the phrase. It turns out it was William Shakespeare. He said, some men are born great, some people achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And one pundit added, some of us manage only to grate on others. Isaac was a man that we have said through this whole series was not great in the human sense, not great in an earthly sense. When we think of heroes of the faith, Isaac is not one of the ones that we put up there. Interestingly enough, his name shows up in the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, where he's commended for looking for the city that is to come, commended for living for Jesus Christ. Well, he didn't know of Christ then. He knew simply of the seed that had been promised, but living for the glory of God, hoping and trusting in him. We decided that through it all, Isaac was a type of Christ, the type also of us. We have the same covenant. We have God's grace at work in, on, in us and on us. We live a life that is primarily about Jesus Christ, primarily in the covenant that God gives. We too were created to point to Christ. We serve God, hopefully, faithfully, by his grace, and we encourage or are encouraged in the faith by the things that God does in our lives. We looked last week at the legacy of such a one. Today, we're going to take a look back we're going to review what we've studied about Isaac. And we're going to look at four identifications that I've called them about Isaac this morning so that we learn what I think is the greatest lesson or lessons of this series. Isaac, just like us, and if the things that are said about Isaac this morning can be said of us, I think that we will be people that have received God's grace people that are grateful, people that are living in the power that God gives. So let's dig in quickly to the four IDs of Isaac. The first is simply this. I've called him Joe Average. We've already discussed the fact that he's not like Abraham. He wasn't the man that God called from Ur of the Chaldees, demonstrated great faith and followed God to a land that, that he did not know. Isaac knew exactly where the land was. He'd been raised there. He'd been raised to understand all of that. But what we discover in the life of Isaac is that he was finite. Surprise, 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 aren't we all? Finite. There's a limitation to what we are and what we have and what we can do. Though called by God to faith, though demonstrated by God who he is and what he demands of us, we are unable in and of ourselves, limited because of our own sin and sinfulness, our finiteness to what God has called us to do. And yet, we're also fallen, as was Isaac. We and in here, I don't mean so much that he's sinner. We're going to talk about that in the next point. Here, I simply mean that he is, though aspiring to greatness, and, and by greatness, I really mean God's greatness. I believe that each person is born knowing who God is or knowing that God is and is born understanding that that God deserves glory are attributing to him his worth, 
are reflecting what he is back to him. But because of our rebellion, because of our fallenness, we tend to take that glory for ourselves. We refuse sometimes to turn it back to him. Isaac, though he was born and created to point to Christ, though he married and learned to trust God, though he had problem children as do some, all of us, though he had problems with work and people stealing what was his, though he had some vices that he could not control, he lost his kids, he died, he was just like us, Joe Average. But that brings us to understand that the things that he did accomplish and the things that were accomplished in his life were done by a not-so-average God. God is infinite. He's, that, that's one of his... We call them inimicable attributes. In the shorter catechism question, we're told that God is infinite. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Those are incommunicable attributes, which is to say, though God makes us in his image, we are not created infinite. We are created finite. We are not created eternal. We are everlasting, but we had a beginning, and we were not created unchangeable. I think that's where sin came from. We changed from our original righteousness to instead rebelling against God. But God is all three of those in the things that he does communicate to us. His wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, truth. I left one out. I can't remember it. You'll tell me about it later. God communicates those things to us and we reflect those things back to him as we strive by his grace to live for that. But God is gracious. Though we, finite and fallen, have rebelled against us, God chose to do for us, even as he did for and to Isaac. God made him the type of Christ. He didn't simply wake up one morning and decide to be that. God gave him the perfect wife. She was more suitably fit for him than we think our wives or our husbands are suitably fit for us. But God gives wives. He gave him a bride, one never seen, but he loved. God grew his faith, gave him kids, guaranteed things for his kids, kept him and his kids, forgave him, reunited and reconciled warring and murderous brothers, and blessed him anyway. And my point just in that is this. Isaac was an ordinary man with an extraordinary God. And if you grasp that this morning, that you and I, not necessarily heroes of the faith, not called to anything more, perhaps, than simply an ordinary existence in which our highest call is to raise the next generation to love and serve Jesus, starting with those who are in our own homes. We can't do it because we are what my father calls subhuman. I like the phrase, we were created human, but we sinned, and so we're less than what we were created to be. That makes us subhuman. So to err is subhuman, to forgive divine. But God is God. He's the only one, the always God. He condescends to us. We don't earn anything. He's the one who said, above me, beside me, there is no other. His name speaks of his aseity. Big word just means self-existence. His name, I am, or I will be. He is God. There was a, uh, I met him once. His name, I, to the best of my knowledge, still is Jim Miller. I don't believe he's gone to be with the Lord. Jim was a mechanic. He worked on airplanes. Nothing spectacular about Jim. He wasn't the world's greatest preacher. He wasn't even the world's greatest mechanic. He just wanted to serve God and did it with jars. Jungle Air and Aviation or in radio service, I believe. I probably mangled that name. Talk to Dunk. He can tell you what it really is. He worked for jars. But what he did all the while he worked with jars was he had a young man that would work with him. And while they were working, they'd talk about the scriptures. That's all they do just talk. 
He'd talk about what it looked like in his life. He'd talk about what it was to live for Jesus Christ. Jim Miller, ordinary mechanic, extraordinary disciple maker for Jesus Christ, but only by the grace of God in Christ. You, me, at best, ordinary subhumans saved by an extraordinary God of grace. Isn't that something? The second thing he was was Joe Sinner. You can look at his life and you can see where he messed up. It says that's proof that he was a sinner. He only died because of sin. He died. He was sinful. He acted according to his nature. He was selfish. He acted according to his nature. He said, me first. That was seen best in the foods that he desired, what he wanted to do for Esau, despite God's saying no. He lied about his wife. He chose a favorite son. He chose to fit into the culture around him. He ignored God sometimes. He fed his desires, failed as a husband, failed as a parent. But God, don't you just love those words? Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a sermon on just those two words. But God, so opposite to who we are, does so much different from what we do, but God, but God, in this case, who is holy, totally different from you and me, and who is also merciful, how else could we be righteous? How else could a righteous and just God deal with sinners? Says Paul in Romans chapter 3, God is merciful. He forgave. He picked a favorite too. He picked several of them. He picked Isaac. He picked Jacob. He overrode the sins of and the mistakes of Isaac. He overcame them. He used him. He blessed him. God gracious. We got an unfaithful man with an incredibly faithful God. Isn't that something? Though we prove faithless, and we will, and we do, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Paul says in Romans 7, we don't do what we want to do. We are unfaithful. We do the things we don't want to do, but God does what he is. And God gives us the power not to sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation takes you, but such as is common to man. And God is, here's our word, faithful. He will, with the temptation, also provide a means to escape so that you can bear it. That's bear the temptation. He doesn't take the temptation away. He just strengthens you in the midst of it. Sometimes that strength is just enough to say, no, I won't do that. And then you need to keep on saying, no, I won't do that. But God gives us the strength not to sin. Jesus said it this way, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Jesus says, I've already overcome the world for you. His name was Harold. I had to look it up yesterday to make sure. It was Fickett, not Fickert. I know several of those. Harold Fickett Jr. He was a freshman at Gordon College the same year I was. He was um, brilliant. The only problem was he was the only one that would tell you that. He was arrogant out the wazoo. But he got really turned on to philosophy, especially the philosophy of a man named Nietzsche. And he left Gordon College and he left the faith. He went on to chase Nietzsche. Somewhere around five or six years later, he called his dad and he said, Dad, his dad was a pastor of a big church in uh, California, came to be president of what was then Barrington College, a Christian college in Rhode Island. It united with Gordon College about 10 years after that. My alma mater is now known as the United College of Gordon and Barrington. Nonetheless, he came to be president of Barrington and his son had abandoned the faith. But he called his dad, he said, Dad, I've chased Nietzsche to his logical conclusion and realized that the highest good for Nietzsche is suicide. And I just believe that the worst of Christianity offers more than what Nitschke does. I'm coming back. And he did. All those years wasted. You're saying he didn't waste much. Well, he wasn't, after that, brilliant as he was, he, I don't know that he necessarily did much. He got in with Frankie Schaefer 
and uh, wrote a book together with, that's Francis's son. They, um, they had some really good insights into what's going on. Harold Fickett, as it turns out, has gone on to write much more. Uh, you can find him online. But uh, I'm just amazed at the faithfulness of God. His dad spoke at a banquet for me once. He spoke on Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. He said, I saw that promise come true in the life of my son. Unfaithful sinner with a faithful God. We have that. Isn't God great? Thirdly, I want you to note that he was Joe Covenant. That's not the college. He didn't have a letter sweater. It simply says he lived where Isaac stayed. Jacob came back and lived where Isaac stayed. That's in the covenant land. That's in the land that God promised to Abraham, to Isaac. And now that Jacob's back, it's promised as well to Jacob. In all of this, Jacob is rather on the passive side. Jacob didn't go out and win this land. Jacob didn't decide to make this land his. He simply assumed that it was his because it was given to him by his father who was given it by God. God did the heavy lifting, but he was committed, committed enough to stay. Even when there was difficulty, he simply went still in the land to the land of the Philistines where he lied. But he had this great start. He took the wife that God gave him. He trusted God, even in the midst of his lies. He trusted that God was going to provide for him. Because one of the reasons I think that he lied was because he knew that he had to have kids that were going to inherit from him. And he needed to raise them. So he had to stick around. He, uh, just, But apparently, he repented. After he tried to bless Esau, instead of Jacob, and God straightened him out, it says that he blessed Jacob and sent him off to get a wife. The God, who was absolutely active, he inaugurated and kept the covenant, was also committed. He never quit. He never left. He promised. He promised first that Isaac would be the promised child. And then he promised to bless him with the covenant. He gave him the wife. He protected him, provided for him. Even when he thought he'd lost all of those wells, he recalled him. He reused him. He blessed his son Jacob as he promised he would. What we've got is a man who, though fallen and though ordinary, still persevered in trusting God. And what he discovered was that he had a patient and trustworthy God. Isn't that something? All we need to do is keep on believing. John tells us that's the victory. He didn't say faith gives the victory. He said faith is the victory. We just need to keep on believing. Even when we fail, we need to keep on believing that God is faithful. We need to keep on believing in the patience of God slow to anger. We need to keep on believing that God can still be trusted, that what he promised to us yesterday, he still promises to us today and will promise to us tomorrow. Even when we fail tomorrow, even when we disappoint ourselves, God can still be trusted to keep us tomorrow. Isn't that something? We think that when it's not easy, we'll just quit. I can't imagine it's easy to love sinners who continue to rebel against him. I can't imagine that it's easy on God to look at us when we sin and say, I've already taken care of it in Jesus. To be so satisfied with one sacrifice on a hill outside of the city of Jerusalem that he would look at you and me and say, I knew you were going to do that and I forgave you anyway because of what my son did. Isn't that something? The God who is trustworthy, God enables us, strengthens us, walks with us in the middle of our temptations, trials, the tough times of life. God says this, when you've done everything and you stand, I want you to keep on standing. That's it. 
But that comes in a passage where he gives us the tools necessary to stay in. They're called the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. So that having done all, you can still stay in. Paul in Philippians says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. His name was William. I don't know that anyone called him Bill or Billy. But William suffered with depression all of his life. The story is told, true story, that he decided one day to take his life. He lived in London. He walked out his front door and he hailed a cab. And the horse-drawn carriage pulled up. He got in it and he told the man, I want you to go to the bridge. I don't know whether he meant Tower Bridge, London Bridge, whatever bridge he meant. Take me to the bridge. He intended to jump off. The fog was so thick that the driver didn't really know exactly where he was going. And he drove for a long period of time. And when he thought he was there, he pulled on the reins. He said, William, we're there. And William got out and walked ahead of himself and walked right back in his own front door. (laughs) William Cooper, C-O-W-P-E-R. Look it up in the back of our hymnal. Several of our hymns are written by William Cooper. Because through all of his depression, all of his life, in and out of institutions, he knew the faithfulness of God. He knew the patience and the trustworthiness of a God who could take even him, who found it so hard to believe that God is good, and trust him in the midst of that. You too can trust that patient, trustworthy God. Finally, I want you to know, Joe disappointment. Isaac lived 180 years. If you knew you were going to have 180 years, what would you do with 180 years? I don't know. I I read an article about a guy said, uh, you know, when I saw the package and it said adds 10 years to life, I started using what was in the package. He said, I read if you take this vitamin, you'll add five years to your life. And I took that vitamin. He said, I read that if you did this exercise, you could add three years of life. He said, I did all of that stuff. And then one day I realized I was adding the years between 80 and 90 instead of the years between 30 and 40. (laughs) Didn't sound so exciting to me anymore. 180 of them. From 80 to 180, what are you going to do with those years? Hope you took your vitamins, ate your good cereals, did your exercise. What would you do? Isaac was full of possibilities. The expectations of a promised child. You're Abraham. You're Sarah. You get a miracle child when you're 90 and 100. You expect great things from this kid that's going to inherit the promise of God. And yet, at the start we talked about his ordinariness. It seemed to be a life of unfulfilled possibility, did it not? Steve Brown says, I am so glad that I don't live up to my potential. He said, my potential is to be a whole lot worse sinner than I am. Praise God, I don't live up to my potential. But we're thinking of Isaac and thinking, man, what what potential in Isaac? And he did a great start, perfect bride. And yet he was immature in his marriage, untrusted, prophecy that God had given, silent years. When Jacob goes away for 20, we don't read. It's the story of Isaac. We don't read about Isaac. We read about Jacob. Full of years. But what were they really full of? God, on the other hand, knew everything ahead of time. And please, that's not because God took a peek. God knows everything that's going to take place because God controls everything that's going to take place. If you don't have control, you don't really know. If you can't guarantee that what's going to be in the future actually happens, you don't really know, do you? But God knows. Absolute and fully. God knows because God is sovereign. He can control. He can guarantee and accomplish his ends. He gave him a miraculous start and a bride. He used his marriage in his way. He fulfilled the prophecy. He blessed Jacob. He continues the promise even till today. We've got a man of unrealized potential. But he had an unparalleled promising God. And so do we. Because we got that same God. Despite the fact that our real potential is failure. 
God gives us and fulfills in us a new potential in Christ. You and I are recreated in Christ with the potential to give glory to Jesus. With the possibility of living every moment in the name of Jesus Christ. Of doing what we do so that Jesus is glorified. You didn't want it before. You couldn't do it before. You came to faith in Christ. And however latent, that's what you want now. You want to be one of those who shows up before God and says, I did it for you. That doesn't grab you every moment. I get it. But within you, there is a desire, if you know Jesus, to see him honored and glorified. God put it there. God is at work in the power of his Holy Spirit to fan that into flame and let it take you over. I believe it was John Wesley talking about the crowds that came to see him. He said, they come to watch me burn. They come to watch the zeal of God within me because God has lit this fire in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. To live, says Paul, is Christ. I can do all through Christ. I can do all unto Christ. I can do it all in his name. His name was Harlan. I don't know if they called him Hal, but his name was Harlan. He, uh, he was kind of a, he really liked to cook. That's really what he liked to do. But he didn't do very well at that. In fact, uh, he did so poorly at providing for his family that his father-in-law took his family back and kept his kids from him. And he laid in a field to kidnap his family and take them back and even failed at kidnapping his own family. At the age of 40, he opened a gas station. Don't know why, but Shell Oil decided that they would ask him to open a gas station for them. So he opened a gas station. And he, middle of the Depression, wasn't getting many customers at his gas station. So he started cooking and opened a restaurant. Uh, it did okay, but not great. The gas station eventually failed. He was given a second chance at opening a gas station. And this time, the restaurant that he created to supplement his income as a gas station did so well that he was able to close the gas station and just cook. Because the best thing he ever cooked was chicken. He had a special recipe, 11 secret herbs and spices. And he used a pressure cooker. And that brought people from... He didn't use chicken in his first recipe. It took too long to cook. But he thought... I failed at my first one, I might as well try cooking longer. So he did this chicken. And it wasn't long before somebody came and said, I like that chicken. Will you give me the recipe? He said, no, but I'll let you open it in a restaurant in my name. And the first franchise was opened in Utah. Of all places. The man was in Kentucky. Opened a franchise in Utah. Yeah, he thought, this is a pretty good event. The restaurant, as you can imagine... Failed. <laughs> I didn't imagine that, Jim. So instead, he started, he got his car, took his family. He went to a, every restaurant that he could find. He went in, he said, let me cook my chicken for you. And they said, okay. And he said, do you like it? And they said, yes. And he sold them a franchise. He eventually had enough franchises that he could sell the business for $2 million. And they changed the recipes. <laughs> And he got really mad. And so he started going around the country and telling them how bad the restaurants were. So they sued him. And he countersued. They sued him for $122 million. He countersued. They settled out of court for $1 million. They paid him. And with that $1 million, they agreed to let him teach all of their restaurants how to make gravy right. And to be the spokesman for the Kentucky Fried Chicken brand. Through all of that, he was as wicked a man as you could imagine. He said his biggest problem was cussing. He just cursed a blue streak. 
somebody invited him to an evangelistic meeting one night, and he went, and he was led to faith in Christ. Tearfully, he talked to the preacher. He said, can God take away this cursing? And he said, yes, and God did. He never cursed again. Spent the next 15 years, I was 75 years old, he came to faith in Christ. Faithfully attended that evangelist church, faithfully gave his testimony, faithfully never swore again. God changed him. Harlan the disappointment. Harlan Sanders, the child of God, whom God used. He cared more about what his food tasted like than he cared about money. He gave most of it away in the last 15 years of his life. Didn't care. Just wanted the gravy to taste right. Let me ask you this morning. Who's your God? Y'all have one. You may have more than one. Everybody on this earth has a God. Sometimes it's just the guy you see when you look in the mirror. But everybody's got a God. Is it this great God? Is it this God who is everything that Isaac showed him to be and that we have learned this morning that he is? This series really, today's sermon, it's not really about Isaac. It's a review of Isaac so we get a better look at God is because that's what the series was really about. It's not really about us. Or it is really about us. It's not about Isaac so much. It's about who we are when we come face to face with who that God is is. So the questions this morning are these. Do you have that God? The God that you have, is he the God of the Bible? Is he good? I mean that both relatively and absolutely. Is he perfect? And when you see yourself before him, do you realize you're not? But when you're not, and you come to a sense of fear of that God. And if you don't get there, you probably don't know him well. But when you get that sense of fear of who he is, do you know the God of grace? Do you know the God who took all of your sin and put it on Jesus at the cross? Took all of Jesus' perfect obedience, put it on your permanent record in heaven? Do you know that God? Do you know the God of grace? Are you living for that God? Are you persevering in living for that God? Are you trying to live for that God? If you just, the, as much as we believe in the God of grace, we do not believe in let go, let God. What we believe is this. I can't, but he can, so I will. Repeat that with me. I can't. But he can, so I will. Once more. I can't, but he can, so I will. That's the God we serve. And when we get past the I will, we realize he did. How do you respond to that God? Praise? Awe? Thanks? That should be our response. If you don't know him, you respond in anger. You respond in frustration. You shake your fist at him. You say, leave me alone. Do it my way or don't do it at all. But if you really know him, you ought to respond. There, there's a, a fifth, though, that I want to add there. It's part of your response. If you really understand that you're ordinary, that you're a sinner, that the best thing that can be said about you is you're persevering in a covenant, you disappoint all the time. That ought to make you humble before God. <laughs> you got nothing to present to God and say, God, here's Jim. Aren't you glad I came? <laughs> and he goes, who are you? Humble yourself before that God. And he will use you in ways that you cannot imagine. Think about it for just a minute. You and I are striving to serve a God who when we get there will say this, well done, good and faithful servant. 
That's all? Really? You did a good job of serving. Good job. Is that really what you live for? If not, you don't know him. Because if you know him, then you believe well done, good and faithful servant means more than anything any man can say about you. Means more than anything that you could possess here. Means more than any other phrase in the history of mankind. Well done, good and faithful servant. His name was Louis. He was a king, the 14th king of France by that name. He was known as the Sun King. He was known as King Louis the Great. He reigned for 72 years in France, longest regent ever in European history. When he died, he ordered that all of the lights be turned off in the sanctuary and only a single candle be put over his coffin so that it would emphasize the man that lives there is great. He was the light, the sun king. So everybody came in that was allowed to be there and they entered that French cathedral probably. And when the priest stood up, he reached over and he extinguished the candle and he said four words, only God is great. Amen. You think about that. Heavenly Father, give us grace to trust in the great God, you. In Jesus' name, amen.